My name is John Byram, and I'm a product manager at Heroku. And this session is getting to a multi-region microservices-based app on Heroku. And we're going to do our best to do this as much in demo as we possibly can. This truly is a step-by-step -step session. Um, to set a little more context, I won't be going into all the pros and cons of microservices and why you might adopt that architectural pattern for two reasons. One, the internet has that covered. Um, there's plenty of information to read. And number two, you're probably bored to death of slides and would prefer to just see demo. So I'm going to try to keep it as much to demo as I possibly can. Now, with that all set up, I had two quick questions. One, how many folks know about Heroku? OK, so pretty much everyone knows about Heroku. And how many folks are actually using microservices-based or microservices applications in their architecture? Fewer folks. Cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So have to show this slide. Everything I'm going to show in this presentation is generally available, but you still shouldn't make stock decisions or purchase decisions based on what I say. I am but a lowly product manager. So the folks, for the folks who didn't raise their hand, the big question is, what is Heroku? And the pitch or the vision for Heroku is it's the fastest way from your developers to go from idea to URL. And the good news is you don't have to believe me, because I'm going to show this in a demo in just a second. Without Heroku, if we're trying to get an application on the web, we have all of these decisions to make. We have to figure out what IS provider we're going to work with. We have to find a, you know, figure out our operating system setup. Are we going to use Docker? Are we going to actually set up a Kubernetes cluster? How in the world are we going to do storage and persistence in that Kubernetes cluster? How should load balancing, routing, and network and DNS work? How are we going to monitor the Kubernetes cluster? And how are we going to handle logging? All of these decisions that we have to make just to get our application live on the web. And the truth is, when we're working on these problems, they're really not differentiating our business. They're not adding a lot of value back to our users. We're just mucking with infrastructure. And the idea by Heroku is we take all of this, care of all of this for you, so you can just focus on building software. Let's talk about the application that we're going to show in the demo. Here's where we're going to start. It's a monolithic application. And it's for doctors to check their patient's diabetes data. So they can see the patient, their provider, the A1C score, as well as what is the long-term health risk of having that A1C score. It pulls from three data sources. It calculates the A1C risk. And it's available in one region. So that's where we're going to start. And here's where we'll end up. We're going to have our application in three regions, in Frankfurt, Oregon, and Tokyo. We're going to talk to Google Compute Engine via VPN connection. We're going to talk to a Mongo database living in AWS via VPC peering link. And we're going to pull data out of Salesforce. We're also going to have a microservice in this application that will deploy via Docker. So this is where we're headed. And like I promised, we're four minutes into the talk, and let's go to the demo. OK. So to give you a little context, we're going to start with our application pipeline. And here you can see that we have two environments set up. I have my staging environment right here, as well as my production environment. So now let's pretend we have a real life scenario. And I'll open up the application where a product manager comes to me. And he says, John, I want to make it really simple uh, for a doctor to see um, the risk scores on the right-hand column. I want you to be able to color code that. And as a developer, I'm going to go ahead and make that change. So I'll come back to our pipeline, and let's edit our code in GitHub. So I'll click on GitHub. I'll go into our code. And I'm just going to edit some code and uncomment a JavaScript file, because I'm a very productive developer. Rather than committing directly into master, I'm going to say color coding changes. 
And what I'm going to do is create a pull request. Now, we've all been in this scenario before where you're a developer. Someone's asked you for something. And you say, um, you know, you say, have you made that change yet? And you're like, sure. And I'm going to show it on my local machine. And I'm going to have to set up a screen sharing session. Or I'm going to push that code to staging. And something you know, isn't right with it or it conflicts with another change. And basically, sharing just with the designer or the product manager the change they wanted to see can be difficult. With review apps as part of this pipeline, every time we create a pull request, what we're actually doing is creating a completely new application that inherits its settings from the staging environment. So if I come over here and view the log, you can see that we're actually building a completely new application. And once this is all built, I'm able to then actually give a URL to my product manager, to my designer, so they can play with the changes themselves. So it looks like it was deployed. I can open the app in the browser. And here's the change that we've made. I mean, super powerful to be able to just slack this to a PM or a designer and say, here, check it out for yourself. So again, the fastest way for you to go from an idea to something that's actually on the web. Then when we're ready, obviously, we merge this into master, and that's going to redeploy staging for us. Let's talk about our production environment. So we looked at the review app, and here we have our production environment, and it's running in Frankfurt right now. One of the things you'll notice is that there's a little chevron next to the application name, and that's because this application is running in a private space. So the private space basically gives me the same exact development experience with review apps, um, you know, with me able to, do, to really iterate quickly, um, but it's all in a single tenant environment running inside of an AWS VPC which means I have complete network control over all of the traffic that comes into and out of um, that VPC. And I'm the only tenant that's in that VPC. So private spaces is a great offering if you're looking to build a high compliance application or you just have a, a difficult network architecture. So let's go ahead. And I'm going to come back to my, my pipeline. And let's walk through the production application. So here's my production application. And you, like I mentioned, we're pulling data from three different sources, Salesforce, an Amazon VPC, and Postgres. Let's start with the patient name, which is coming from Salesforce. So if I come over into the Salesforce dashboard, you know, I'm pulling this information out, but how does Salesforce know that they can trust that I have access to this data. With private spaces, Heroku provides you with stable outbound IP addresses that I'm then able to whitelist with Salesforce so that it knows that all the traffic that's coming from this private space can actually access the data in Salesforce. So here are the four outbound IP addresses. And if I come into the networking tab, you can see that I, these are the four outbound IP addresses that all traffic will come from from a private space. So if we come back to our application, you know, this provider information is actually coming out of a Mongo database that's living inside of Amazon, inside of an Amazon VPC. And obviously, I don't want to communicate with that information over the public internet. So what we've done is set up a VPC peering connection. So here's the MongoDB that's running. I can scroll down. And you can see that there's the VPC ID. And if I come back to the networking tab in my private space, you can see that we have a VPC peering connection already set up. Next, we have our A1C data that's stored in Heroku Postgres. And these were add-ons that I was able to very easily just add to my application. I've got Postgres and Redis running. And these are running in shield and private plans which means these databases aren't accessible to the public internet. And all of the connections from my applications and that are running in containers are actually talking to that database and Redis privately. So there's nothing traversing the public internet. So here's our application. We've got the three data sources. And we were able to talk, communicate, and pull all of that data privately because of private spaces. 
So we're running in, in one, in one um, private space right now in one region. We're running in Frankfurt. So we now get into the stage in our application where we want to add additional regions, right? This is a multi-region um, talk. So how would I do that? Well, setting up a private space is incredibly simple. I simply come over to the Spaces tab. I'll click New Space. And if I wanted to set up something in Tokyo, I simply add the space name, select Tokyo, and hit Create Private Space. It's that simple. I can define the sitter range that I want to use so I can make sure that the subnet that's associated with this private space doesn't conflict with a subnet um, in my, the rest of my architecture. So I can set that up, and I'm obviously not going to do it here because it takes a little bit of time. Um, but it's very simple to actually just set up a private space. So we'll come back to our pipeline, and I'm going to simply add the additional applications. So let's add ones that have already been set up. We'll add, we're now expanded to Oregon. We've now expanded to Tokyo. And with each one of these applications, they have their own database, they have their own Redis running inside of the private space so that we have data residency. So you remember the example earlier where I made this sort of color-coded column? And I've you know, pushed it. Let's pretend that I've pushed that to staging. And now I want to roll it out to production. All I have to do is click Promote to Production. And I can easily deploy it to all three of my production instances. It's just one click to have that multi-region app running. So we get to this stage, and we're growing, and we're growing as a company, and we start to think about a microservices architecture. So what do we do? We go through and we find you know, what service would be really easy for us to break off. Like, what could we deploy independently so that our developers are able to push whenever they need to? They can use whatever language they want. And so we look at our application and we say, hey, you know what's a great candidate for this? This microservice for, that calculates the risk score. Let's break it out of our monolith. We'll deploy it as a separate application on Heroku and then talk to that microservice so another team of developers can deploy that independently. So all we had to do to do that was actually deployed as a separate application. It's really that simple. So I'm going to come over and pull up the application page. And this is our microservice. It's the health demo risk. And one of the things you might notice is that this is an internal application. This is a feature we just made generally available two weeks ago. But this allows you to deploy an application in Heroku that's only accessible from other services within the private space or via a VPC or VPN connection. So it's a great candidate for microservices. If I come over here and I try to do this, you know, I won't bore you to tears, but it's just going to eventually time out. I can't access this microservice from the public internet. So now that our development team has identified a, a service that we want to break off of the microservice, we've deployed the microservice. We say, hey, you know, we want to build a client application um, that lets patients check their A1C scores. And we want to run it in Google Cloud. And we want to use your microservice. We can do that too. So I'm going to come over to Google Cloud. And pull up their console. Let's make sure I'm on the right account. Cool. And we'll go to the Compute Engine instance that this application is running on. Let me get rid of it's not secure. OK, so we've launched our client application. I am not a designer, OK? I didn't have time to have this checked by designers. I put in my A1C score, and it's going to give me my long-term risk back. Now, we're calling that same microservice privately. And to prove it to you, I'm going to go ahead and SSH into the instance. So we go ahead. And if you haven't used Google Cloud, this is a super cool feature with the ability to SSH right from the dashboard. Okay. 
So now we're in our Compute Engine instance. I'll show you the environment variables. And you can see that the risk URL that we're hitting is the same one that we weren't able to access publicly. Now, how are we doing this? We're obviously doing this via VPN connection. So we've set up a VPN connection from our private space to GCP. And here you can see that we have two tunnels set up. This is another feature we just made generally available two weeks ago. So internal routing and VPN is what makes this feature possible. So we're in multiple regions. We have a microservice. We're able to hit that microservice from GCP, and we're able to deploy that microservice via Docker. So this application, here is the little Python application that makes up that microservice. This is the Docker file that we use to build this microservice. And you can see that I'm not using one of the Heroku stacks. I'm just grabbing an off-the-shelf from Docker Hub Python image. In fact, it's, um, you know, I'm installing, installing my dependencies and my requirements and finally running a web server. That's all it takes. Now, the feature I'm about to show is in public beta, but we're actually able to push this application and have Heroku build my Docker images. So I'm going to go ahead and just do, just do an empty commit. Oops, got to get in the right directory. Okay, so now we're pushing our code up to GitHub. Heroku is recognizing that there is a change in GitHub is going to start my build directly on the platform. So I'll come back to my risk microservice. And in just a second, we'll see the build kick off. So this sometimes takes a little bit to kick off. I'll give it just a second. I'll try refreshing. But now you can view the build process. So here, if you're familiar with Docker, we're building the Docker image directly on Heroku. I get to take advantage of review apps when I do um, use Docker on Heroku. So there's no reason if your development team says, hey, I want to learn use Docker to package our application, there is no reason you have to go to the next step and say, OK, we have to have Kubernetes now. Right? That's a massive amount of work. You can use Docker and all the greatness that the local development experience that Docker provides with your development teams, but not have to go all in on Kubernetes, which is a massive undertaking. I get all of this great development experience and Docker. Cool. So that's the demo. And I just wanted to quickly recap you know, what we saw. We started with our staging environment, which was running in the common runtime, which is multi-tenant, available in the US and the EU, and it's ISO 001, 17, 18, SOC 2 Type 1 compliant. The three um, production environments, or the three regions that we set up, were each individual private spaces, which again are running inside of their own Amazon VPC, which I have complete control over from an ingress and egress perspective. I can set up VPC and VPN connections. It's available in six global regions. It's the same ISO level and SOC 2 level as the common runtime. And there's an option for me to be HIPAA and PCI compliant. And before I go to the next slide, I'm going to set something up really quickly, because it takes a little bit of time to set up. So just bear with me. Okay, and one more second. Cool. So that's kicked off. Let's come back to my slides. Each private space that we set up uses an AWS account that's dedicated to you. There's no other customers of ours running inside of that AWS account. And each, built, each space is built inside a new VPC. And like we showed, Postgres and Redis are running inside of that private space. And we're talking to those databases privately. We're in six global regions. 
We give you stable outbound IPs. This is what allowed us to whitelist our application with Salesforce. We were able to set up a VPC peering connection with AWS. We were able to set up a VPN connection with GCP and talk to our microservices privately. And I didn't show this feature, but we have complete control over the IP addresses and ports for ingress and egress for everything that comes into the private space. As it relates to microservice communication, this is the feature we just made GA two, two weeks ago, but it's our internal routing feature. This allows you to create that app that's only available from other services in the private space or via VPC peering or VPN connection. And it's as simple as setting a flag once you create the new application. I didn't show this off, but services within the private space are able to communicate easily via DNS service discovery. So in my application, I can use a very simple host name, like on the top, and it will resolve to the private IP address of the service that's running in the private space. But wait, there's more. We also have the ability for a private space to be HIPAA and PCI compliant with a feature called Shield. So if you're making a banking application or you're dealing with healthcare data, like in this example, I want it to be HIPAA compliant. So that was actually a shield private space that I was running in. It handles strict TLS enforcement, so TLS 1.0 is disabled on all traffic. The dynos, which are our version of containers, um, have an encrypted file system. We have Postgres, has encryption enforcement, we allow you to send all of your logs to a single HTTP drain. So if you wanted to easily connect your private space to something like Splunk, you can do that with this feature. And finally, and this is a big one from a compliance perspective, we offer keystroke logging of all your production bash sessions. So it must be incredibly difficult to set up a shield private space, right? A little of, bit of a leading question but you probably saw this when I was doing the demo. Let's go ahead and get back to here. But if I was to go ahead and set up a new private space, oops, go into spaces, I put in my space name, the region, et cetera, and all I have to do to get all of these features is flip this switch. That's it. And now I can be in a private space that's both HIPAA and PCI compliant. So I wanted to show you, and I took a couple seconds to set this up earlier, keystroke logging in a production environment. So right now I've got two windows here. I'm actually tailing the logs of my production environment or my production application. Let's see if I can make that bigger. See that well enough, cool. And over here is my connection to the production environment. So let's just list the contents and let's do something nefarious. and we can go ahead and pretend we're a bad actor. If I come over to my logs, you can see I've got the user input added to my log stream right there. There's the ls command, and I know it's a little bit hard to read because it gets chopped off, but there's my remove command. And here's the session ID that's associated with my connection to the production system. So we have keystroke logging as part of the shield feature. Let's go ahead and terminate that. You know, so this is where we ended up. And it really didn't take us that long to set this all up. We were in three regions. We had connections to all, private connections to all of these services. We had a microservice, we deployed with Docker, all of the buzzwords that were in my abstract for this session, we covered in here. And it really doesn't take that long to set all of this up. The only reason I didn't set up all those connections um, is because it's like watching paint dry, so I figured you can trust that it doesn't take too long to set up a VPC and VPN connection. But this is where we ended up. So thanks everybody for coming. We've got about 15 minutes left, so if you guys have any questions, please fire away.